Welcome to the 2016 Alaska Fire Presentation Series. It is being brought to you by the Alaska Natural Resource and Outdoor Education Association, or ANRO. ANRO is dedicated to promoting and implementing excellence in natural resource, outdoor, and environmental education for all Alaskans. My name is Kathy Rezebeck, and I would like to introduce our speaker today, Eric Miller. Eric has worked in the area of fire ecology for 17 years, starting as a fire effects monitor in Yellowstone National Park, where he worked for eight years. He came to the Bureau of Land Management, Alaska Fire Service, as a fire ecologist in 2008. His educational background is in botany and plant community ecology. Today, Eric will talk about prescribed burning in Alaska. Welcome, Eric. All right, thank you. Um, when I got asked to do this presentation, I had the impression that there wasn't a whole lot of uh, prescribed fire done in Alaska, but um, through the process of putting this uh, lecture together, I actually discovered that there's a, actually a pretty rich history of prescribed fire in Alaska. Um, before I get into prescribed fire, it's a little bit useful to understand um, wildfire in general. Um, free burning wildfire can be an incomprehensibly powerful natural disturbance agent. Fire is capable of spectacular destruction, but it's also capable of life giving rejuvenation. So we see immediate destruction in the flames of a crown fire, but few of us seldom uh, revisit a site and see. Um, plants and animals that come back afterwards um, in the following years. So forests change slowly and so we have this perception of them as static. Um, when we see them consumed by fire we, in, we instinctively um, uh, respond to that emotionally. We actually mourn the loss of this uh, forest that we've come to know. However, None of us have lived long enough to have seen fire sweep across the landscape hundreds of times in the past, uh, nor the cycles of succession where mosses and lichens, herbs and shrubs uh, recolonize and re-sprout and give way to hardwoods and shade and conifers over 100 years. So this perception of fire as a powerful force has led us in the past to attempt to extinguish all fires, leading to futility um, in terms of expense and economics and also unforeseen consequences, um, such as uh, hazard fuel buildup. Some species depend on vegetation that is only there in the years or decades following fire. Um, fire science and ecological understanding has led us since to use fire to our advantage, either to prevent unwanted effects or to promote rejuvenation and protection of ecosystem services and function. So the use of wildland fire to achieve desired objectives is called prescribed fire. Uh, other names for it are planned fire and controlled burning. Uh, in this uh, lecture, to give you a little heads up on the structure, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reasons why we burn in Alaska. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, the planning process and then Last, I'll talk a little bit about how to actually implement a prescribed fire on the ground. So when I look through the history of prescribed burning in Alaska, all the burns could basically be put into three categories. The first being fuel reduction, um, the second being habitat manipulation, and the last being uh, for research. And some burns address more than uh, one of these reasons. Um, or objectives. So wherever vegetation grows, dead plant parts are produced and in humid climates, uh, biological decomposition reduces the biomass to organic soil layers which are quickly used by living plants. Um, much of the biomass is tied up in above ground living vegetation. So this is a slide from Maine and you can see that the, it's, a, it's a wet, humid, temperate place. And, uh, the organic materials that are shed by the overstory canopy or the trees and the shrubs are biologically uh, reduced and recycled. And a lot of the uh, biomass is held above ground in the plant parts. 
in contrast, someplace in the dry uh, southwest like Arizona, um, fire weather is there all the time, and it's the fuels that are limiting. So in, in this, for example, uh, Ponderosa Pine Forest in Arizona, fire might come through here every 10 or 20 years and burn away all the organic material on the floor. Um, in Alaska, we have something completely different. It's so cold here that biological decomposition is rare and uh, or very slow, and fire weather is rare. So the fire frequency is long. It may take a century or more for fire to reburn uh, a black spruce forest, for example. Uh, as a result, fuel accumulates to great depths on the ground. In one study, uh, they measured about 85% of the total weight of plant material on the lowland black spruce site was in the forest floor. And this is an image of um, uh, somewhat famous uh, fire scientist, Roger Otmar, and he's digging into the ground, pulling out what we call a duff plug. And we're only seeing maybe um, half of the forest floor there, but you can see a very deep organic uh, soil layer. As that soil um, accumulates, it compacts into deep layers, which become very cold and oftentimes are permanently frozen. So great amounts of fuel are always there, but in Alaska, fire weather is not. So we have a long fire cycle ecosystem. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the canopy architecture of black spruce also, which is different from temperate regions. Uh, the low incident angle of sunlight results in trees that have vertically oriented fuel loading. So you can see they look like, like sticks. It's so they can catch that low incident uh, angle of the sunlight. And trees are adapted to retain living branches all the way to the ground. And the moisture content in the needles is also very low compared to temperate regions. So these black spruce ignite and carry fire through the canopy very easily. And a lot of times there are arboreal lichens in the branches, which are dry um, and dry very quickly and are very flammable. So we have um, a combination of great fuel, uh, fuel accumulation on uh, the forest floor plus this vertically oriented uh, spruce crown architecture. So you have a fuel complex that is conducive to crown fire. And black spruce in particular doesn't underburn uh, like it does in other places, like in uh, Ponderosa Pine Forest or in interior Douglas Fir Forest, whose canopies are often high above the ground and less prone to crown fire. So for these reasons, prescribed fire for hazard fuel reduction in Alaska um, is actually uh, fairly rare. I couldn't, I could find very few references um, to that kind of a burn. Uh, long summer days result in long burn periods uh, or the warm, dry, unstable times of day when fire is able to spread. Uh, so in uh, spruce forests like that, fuels are most often mechanically reduced or removed. Um, this is a slide of uh, a shear blade uh, operation where where a bulldozer comes through while the ground is still frozen and basically shears off um, the entire uh, above ground um, forest. And uh, it'll be burned at a uh, time of the year when fire danger is low. And that's typically what happens with uh, hand crews also. Is they'll uh, cut down, thin the trees, uh, make piles and burn those piles when, when fire danger is low. Um, the majority of fuel hazard fuel redu reduction uh, types of burns uh, occur in dead grass on um, military lands. Um, most prescribed fire um, is done right after snow melt and before green up on uh, Department of Defense training ranges. And the idea is that they want to prevent ignitions later in the season. Um, when they're using those training ranges, uh, they're using uh, tracers and bombs and rockets and hand grenades and uh, flares and grenades and all sorts of things that will start fires. So the uh, Alaska Fire Service and uh, the state of Alaska uh, burn those training ranges in the springtime. Uh, this is an image of um, the small arms complex right across from Fort Wainwright in, in Alaska or uh, in the uh, uh, Fairbanks. And uh, this is the somewhat tricky burn to, to pull off because it's so close to Fairbanks, we have to get the winds right so that we don't smoke out the, the, the town. 
Um, so the next reason is we burn is for habitat manipulation. And wildlife is uh, pretty high up there for uh, a reason why we want to alter habitat. Prescribed fire may be used to alter ecosystems to favor desirable plants for animals. In Alaska, fire has been used to enhance habitat for waterfowl, grouse, and moose. Uh, but fire also benefits snowshoe hares, bulls, and other small mammals, which in turn feed predators such as raptors, martens, and weasels. Um, decadent willow stands may grow too tall for moose to access. Um, burning willow or aspen in the spring top kills the willow while protecting the roots. Um, and that willow will re-sprout and regrow from the underground growing parts. Uh, following burning, both the quantity and quality of the forage is improved. So fire opens up the canopy and allows sunlight to reach the ground, stimulating the organisms that decompose organic soil and making nutrients available to plants. And the ash and nutrients that are otherwise locked up in decadent vegetation become available for new growth. This is a, a burn we did a, a few years back up, uh, behind Ielson Air Force Base on uh, Fort Wainwright uh, to improve grouse habitat. So we're burning uh, a mixed uh, aspen and birch forest here. Uh, standing dead trees provide roosts for raptors and homes for cavity nesters such as woodpeckers and fallen trees provide cover for bulls, hares, and marten uh, shelter that is especially valuable in winter. Uh, grouse and moose prefer early successional hardwood forests so prescribed fire is used to top kill the aspen and birch resulting in uh, prolific sprouting and suckering which provides good browse. So uh, this is a, uh, that grouse burn I mentioned in, in 2010, just hours before we burned it. And then uh, 43 days later, um, and you can see the, the char on the, on the bowls of the tree, but fireweed and, and, the, and the birch are already re-sprouting. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting that the birch will actually re-sprout from the root collar of the, of the bowl while uh, aspen will re-sprout from the entire root system, so it's a little, little bit slower. We'll see it in the next slide here. You can see aspen coming up everywhere. So this, this is exactly, uh, almost exactly one year later, um, <clears throat> and you can see really nothing's been killed. Uh, the trees are still alive. It's just that they're re-sprouting. Um, and if I remember right, the uh, density of suckers was over a, a million an acre here, so pretty prolific uh, regeneration. And that's what uh, a million stems per, per hectare looks like. Uh, fire has been used near Delta Junction to convert spruce forest to grasslands suitable for bison grazing. And creating and maintaining grassland helps keep bison off private and agricultural lands. Um, the farmers don't particularly want bison um, in their agricultural areas. So, um, and then uh, one other burn plan was in place in 2009 in the, uh, uh, the Farewell area. Um, however, a wildfire came through the ne next year and uh, did our work for us. So um, we got those objectives met in a wildfire, which sometimes happen. Uh, a lot of times these um, burn plans will remain on the books for a very long time and, and then uh, wildfire will come through and, and burn them before we can get the, the prescription window. Um, another uh, habitat manipulation type of burn is to increase landscape diversity. Um, and this is a picture from the Alphabet Hills, which were burned in 2004 to break up the decadent landscape and enhance landscape diversity in the composition of plants and animals. So in this case, the, it's the boundaries between the stand ages and the vegetation types, which was important. Um, and one of the, a few of the reasons might be that owls nest in old trees, and but they forage in the open burn, or um, moose will browse in the regenerating hardwoods, but they'll rest in the cover of mature trees. So those those edges are important. Um, the last reason uh, to burn is for research reasons to learn about fire and fire effects. Uh, and the last 
10 or 15 years, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game has been interested in bringing willow and alpine areas of the Alaska range to improve moose forage. And uh, burns of this type have not been attempted before, um, so they're fairly uncertain um, what kind of fire effects they'll get and what kind of fire behavior they'll be able to achieve. Uh, so a, a test burn was done, only three quarters acre, in uh, 2008, just to see um, what kind of fire and behavior and effects they could get. Um, but the overall project has not moved forward because of the tight prescription window and logistical difficulties. And one of the problems is when you burn at higher elevation, you actually need um, warmer and drier weather to get the right conditions. Um, but with warmer and drier weather, you get fires elsewhere and all of your uh, aircraft, ground crews, and all of those uh, firefighting resources get tied up and become unavailable, so then you can't burn. Um, so again, it's not unusual for a, a burn plan to take 10 years to, to implement just because uh, you're waiting for uh, weather and uh, logistical window to open up. Um, frost fire, I didn't have any images of frost fire, I couldn't find any. This was a, a big project um, that was uh, came off the ground in 1999 and uh, in the uh, Caribou Poker Creek long-term ecological research site. Um, it's been called the most documented prescribed fire in history. Over 50 research groups participated and they were interested in learning about emissions of greenhouse gases and other uh, uh, particulates and hydrology and stream chemistry, soil carbon, water, and energy pools and fluxes, permafrost, and forest succession. And all of this data um, was collected to feed global change models. And then uh, in uh, 2000, well, I guess in the early 2000s, uh, there were big fire seasons down south. And uh, uh, some uh, funding and attention was given over to how to treat fuels, uh, hazard fuels. And um, um, those prescriptions were applied in Alaska, but there was some question as to whether they would work, because uh, as everybody says, Alaska is different. Um, so fire managers questioned whether those fuel treatments would work in Alaska. And some computer modeling had been done from information derived from demonstration uh, fuel reduction projects. But um, a group of researchers proposed to do more. They actually ran a prescribed crown fire through experimental fuel treatment plots to see what would happen. Uh, and that was out at uh, uh, Neenana Ridge and um, on, uh, down close to the Tanana River. This is what the uh, forest looked like uh, beforehand, very thick lowland black spruce. And then this is what the thinning looked like afterwards. It was uh, a nominal eight foot uh, bowl spacing and a four foot prune height. So you can see they basically took out the, the lower canopy of the, uh, the trees and, and the shrubs. And so they broke up both the vertical and horizontal continuity of the canopy. And then this is uh, sort of a encapsulated shot of um, the results. The, when the crown fire came through from the right, it basically stopped right at the edge of the, the fuel treatment and dropped to the ground. And then uh, after about uh, 250 feet or so, it actually stopped burning on the ground as well. Um, and then, the, yeah, the, the left-hand side, you can, I don't know if the color comes through in this uh, video very well, but the, the left-hand side is all green canopies and, and in the middle of the, the image are uh, sort of scorched brown orange canopies and, and of course there's there's not much canopy at all on the right hand side where the, the crown fire met the, uh, the fuel treatment boundary. Um, many people believe that it's the trees that carry fire through the forest um, but if you look closely and, and do the science um, the crown fire is overwhelmingly dependent on a surface fire and it's for this reason that uh, researchers and, and, and uh, people designing these fuel treatments focus on the, the ground fuels and what we call the ladder fuels, the brush and lower branches of trees. And the objective here is to break the linkage between the surface fuels and the canopies. So they want to prevent that surface fire from getting up into the crowns and moving as a crown fire.
this is a, an aerial image of that, that same burn. And uh, hopefully you can see this cursor. They started burning down here in the, the bottom of the unit and one crew went east and one crew went west. And you can see that the fire really didn't penetrate into the, the unit very well. Um, that's because it was in the morning and the, and the uh, fuels were still a little bit wet. But by uh, a little bit after lunch, a helicopter came through and dropped some uh, uh, ping pong balls, we call them. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But my mouse disappeared. But they actually generate, generated a, a crown fire that ran uh, north upwards through this image. And uh, oh, there's my mouse again. Okay. This is the, that fuel treatment that I was showing in the other slides there. You can see that patch of green. So the crown fire came this direction, stopped at the edge of the, of the thinning treatment, and basically went out, leaving these fuels green here. So that was a fairly interesting experiment. Um, one part of that experiment dealt with fuel consumption and smoke emissions. And uh, researchers measure a consumption of the surface fuels uh, by installing pins in the ground. Um, so prior to the burn, they stick that pin in the ground flush with the, the top of the, the surface fuel bed. And then after the fire, they come back and measure how much fuel has been burned away. Um, by knowing the, the depth of burn, uh, the bulk density, the, the fuel layer, and the chemical properties, they are able to estimate how much heat and smoke was produced. And they can use that uh, to make models to make predictions for, for other fires. Depth of burn is considered an excellent measure of fire severity in Alaska. Um, this image here is, a, I believe, in the, the boundary fire from 2004. And um, that ruler is at the top of where the soil was prior to the burn. So that much um, soil was consumed by that fire. So very deep depth of burn. And I'd be surprised if that didn't burn all the way down to mineral soil with the result that um, nothing much has re-sprouted. I would imagine most of these um, herbs have come in from seed. Um, and that's sort of a, a pattern with uh, post-fire regeneration. If, if the burn is light and doesn't remove much fuel, then the response is dominated by regrowth and resprouting of existing vegetation. But if the burn is deep, it favors seeding of new species from outside the burn. Uh, so the depth of burn directly affects the composition and abundance of the vegetation that grows back. One uh, sort of fairly unique objective of um, at least one burn in, in Alaska, the 2007 Manchu burn, and uh, was to expose and or detonate residual unexploded military ordnance. So much of Alaska was used as a training ground for the military with uh, operations dating back to World War II resulting in dispersed and unaccounted munitions and explosives. Um, ordnance is known to be in some drainages called impact areas, but older ordnance could be just about anywhere. Burning away the vegetation allows the army to more easily locate the unexploded ordnance. Um, burn crews are not allowed in the ground, on the ground in these impact areas, and we certainly don't use ground cutting tools such as Pulaski's or, or shovels. Um, control is achieved through smothering tools and water. Hand ignition is limited to roads and fire lines that have been cleared for travel and ignition in the interior is done by aircraft. So the dangers of uh, prescribed fire and wildfire in known uh, unexploded ordnance areas are the subject of concern and ongoing science for us. So those are the reasons to burn. I wanna go a little bit into the, how we plan uh, prescribed burning and some of the rationale behind it. Um, every prescribed fire uh, addresses one or more resource objectives. And um, just some examples here to increase the range of stand ages in the alphabet hills to improve landscape species diversity, or to create and maintain early cereal forests uh, to reduce the chances of escaped fire. Um, 
to rejuvenate decadent hardwoods to improve habitat and subsistence moose hunting opportunities. So these are just some examples. Um, and these resource objectives come from the landowner's land or resource management plan. And they tend to be, I call them objectives, but they're really more goals. They're not very specific. Um, they are sort of uh, broad stroke um, pictures of what we want the land and resources to look like. And then every prescribed fire also has an operational objective and that's designed to meet the resource objective. And these are more specific and, and directly measurable. And examples are to achieve aspen suckering densities of greater than 10,000 stems per acre within two growing seasons, uh, to consume 50% of large diameter down logs, which we call thousand hour fuels. And we wanna do that immediately post burn. Uh, remove 90% of the dead grass thatch and dead herbaceous fuel to reduce loading and expose the surface for military ordinance cleanup immediately post burn. Um, and these, these objectives differ a little bit from the resource objectives in that they uh, specify a measure and a time frame in which you hope to achieve it. And sometimes uh, the burns require both post, uh, pre and post fire measurements to know if that uh, objective has been met. Um, and then uh, every prescribed fire also has an environmental and fire behavior prescription designed to achieve the operational objectives. And this allows uh, the burn boss to know um, when the, the um, unit should be burned. Um, and this sort of gets into the nitty gritty of uh, weather. For example, wind speeds less than 12 miles per hour relative humidity, which is very important, between 20 and 40%, temperature 40 to 60 degrees. Um, it also gets at uh, the fuel moisture content that's in the, what we call the carrier fuels, the fuels on the ground that are gonna carry that fire through your prescribed burn unit. And we, in this example, we want them to be, be between 15 and 16% moisture content. And um, last, or second to last, there's a, it says burn prior to leaf out in the spring. So it actually tells you the season um, that you want to burn. Um, and you might want to burn prior to leaf out because you want sunlight to get in there and dry out the, the, the surface fuels. Once the hardwoods leaf out, um, the understory can be uh, fairly moist and, and uh, resist fire. And then uh, if you have done all your modeling correctly, your, your flame length should be somewhere between one half and two and a half feet in this example. Um, Last, I'll get into a little bit about implementation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about control lines first. So every prescribed fire has uh, lines of control that anchor the ignition pattern and prevent the fire from moving outside the project area. Um, in this example, in the slide, it's a, it's a road. And once the ignition occurs, um, the right-hand side will be referred to as the black because it's shortly to be black. And then the other side of the road is the green, which we hope will stay green. This is um, a old logging road, can be used as a, as a fire line. And um, can also use uh, rivers and uh, snow banks. Um, and it's hard to even see here, but there's a a hand line on the lower right hand side and it's really really hard to see but it's enough to keep the fire um, within the the burn boundary here in this in this image um, reinforced by firefighters who are using uh, uh, beaters and and smothering tools and some water from bladder bags and that's called a uh, wet line when you put water down and burn off of the water These, um, the, the fire line can be reinforced by a hose lay. Um, in this case, uh, there's a, a Mark III pump in a pond and the unit is completely surrounded by hoses and the firefighter in the, in the middle there is using that hose uh, to douse down um, areas that are of concern. The important thing in all of prescribed burning is to keep the black in the black and the green and the green. Um, 
this image I, I found on the internet and I, I egregiously used it. Um, it's from the, the Nature Conservancy. And I used it because it's a, a, a great illustration of uh, how a prescribed burn is, is done. And it looks like these, uh, the, there are two crews on a prescribed burn. There's, there are the uh, igniters and then there are the holders. And the igniters, uh, looks like my mouse is gone, um, have drip torches or, or other uh, incendiary devices. And it looks like in this image that they have burned on the um, uh, upwind side, um, the wind is heading right to left in this image. So they've burned off the river first so that they're getting backing flames going through the unit. And you can see that those flames are tilted to the left. And they're, those flames are moving much more slowly than they would if they had burned on the, the, the headwind side of that unit. If they had started fire on the right, um, that those flames could have moved right through the unit, spotted over the river, and then it would be off. So firefighters generally start their ignitions on the most advantageous side of, of the unit. And generally, that's the, uh, um, they want to burn into the wind. And they'll burn um, generally from the top of the hill down to the bottom. Because again, they want to keep those flames small and, and slowly moving. So the, the igniting crew has gone around this unit and they're, they've brought fire completely around it. And then a, a second igniter is, is coming down the, the right hand side and, and setting head fire. And then uh, if everything goes according to plan, the, the unit will be black. Um, drip torches are the, the tool of choice. They are filled with a mixture of um, what, what we call drip mix, which is a combination of three parts diesel to one part gasoline. Diesel itself doesn't ignite very well and, and gasoline is explosive, but when you mix them at the right ratio, they, they burn really nicely. And um, you can see a, a wick on the end of those drip torches and that gets ignited and then the fuel flows over that wick, catches fire and is dropped on the ground and it burns for a minute or two. Um, so you can you can drip that fuel out onto the ground to start fires, or you can lay a very big long line of fire. It's a very, very handy tool for, for prescribed fire. In a, a bigger burn, which, you know, maybe thousands of acres, the center of the fire is uh, generally ignited by helicopter. Um, and we're looking at a um, plastic sphere uh, dispensing machine. And, you can see in the, in the hopper, there's a whole bunch of uh, what look like ping pong balls. And those ping pong balls are filled with a chemical, a dry chemical. And when they're dropped from the helicopter, they're briefly stopped and injected with ethylene glycol, which reacts with that uh, dry chemical. And in a few minutes, once that ping pong ball hits the ground, it starts on fire. And you can see in this image here, uh, the helicopter is, has dropped, um, looks like three ping pong balls a few minutes ago, and now they're starting to ignite and, and carry fire. So a helicopter is a great way to ignite the, the middle of a burn if you want to cover some territory fast. And then this last image here um, shows uh, a phenomenon that we try to take advantage of. And, and um, you can see that uh, uh, hand ignition has been brought down both sides of the unit. And then the center of the unit has been fired and you can see great big flames in the middle. And that's because uh, as that middle of that fire burns, it generates its own wind. And that wind uh, does several things. One, it, it kicks up the fire behavior in the middle of the unit. So it's gonna burn a lot hotter in the middle of the unit than it will around the edges. And the second thing it does is suck all that smoke up into um, a column. So in essence, it ejects it. High as, uh, well, what high as you can get it, really. And that uh, serves, one, to, to get the smoke up so that it will disperse. And then, two, it tends to suck uh, embers and, and, and spots and uh, firebrands in towards uh, the center of the unit rather than uh, blowing them out into the green. Uh, so that's uh, sort of the pattern is to bring fire around the unit and then fire out the middle and then just suck everything right into the middle of that unit.
Um, and then uh, my last slide here is about uh, Augusta's cooperation. Fire management is a very complex endeavor and requires discipline, efficiency, and training much more than any individual agency can provide for itself. And this is especially so in Alaska with a small population relative to the size of its wildlands. So it's common for burn plan preparation and implementation to be done by staff from many agencies um, at the federal, state, and local levels. Firefighters on the ground commonly include employees of the state of Alaska, the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, Native Corporations, um, structural firefighters, contractors, um, uh, the Army, um, just to, to name a few. Uh, the roles that the different firefighters assume are, are clearly defined and are the same from burn to burn. Um, so it's a, a plug and play operation. Uh, every um, uh, position on a, on a prescribed fire um, can be filled by a, new, a number of people um, trained to do that role and the roles are the same between prescribed and wildfire. So a prescribed fire minimally have a, a burn boss, a firing boss, um, a holding boss, a monitor, and, and firefighters. And more complex burns will include, include aircraft, engines, water tenders, 20-person uh, hand crews, and, and again, the list goes on. It's more than any one agency can supply at any given time. So uh, the fire community is, is very cooperative, cooperative and uh, coordinated. So um, that concludes uh, my talk on uh, prescribed fire. Um, thank you for attending.